right, tweet is getting posted. Everyone can join the live stream on the PokerTube YouTube channel. Today we have a special guest, Mike Sowers, hailing from North Carolina, now residing in California. I mean, you want to talk about a No Limit Hold'em tournament crusher. Third place in the 2009 10K LA Poker Classic for 650K. Fifth place in the 2011 PCA main event for 700K. Second place in the 2014 WSOP 6 Max for 278K. Six-figure scores just don't stop. Let's talk about online. Second place in the Poker Stars 10K High Roller for 450K. And then first place, I remember this event, the epic full tilt poker 1K multi entry $2 million guarantee for 490K two weeks before Black Friday. I think he even had another ed- entry that got 10th because they won't let him double final table. Memory could be incorrect, but welcome to the podcast, Mike Sowers. And he's out. <laughs> Slight internet problem on Mike's part. He should be rejoining us very shortly. He's going to the local Starbucks or possibly a little bar with Wi-Fi where there's homeless stragglers. So this should be interesting. Stay tuned for Mike's hours to join the podcast. Let's see what we got in the comments, in the chat. Shout out to Jesus420, longtime vlog watcher. You can check out my vlogs on YouTube under the name of Jeff Boski. Over 100 vlogs to choose from the last nine months documenting life in Las Vegas, the tournament grind, the state grind, playing with dogs, raising money for the Las Vegas Boxer Rescue. If you like dogs, you, you like seeing them saved off the streets. Put into a good, loving home. Please donate to the Las Vegas Boxer Rescue. You can check out their Facebook page. Soulful music in the chat. Wants an interview. Uh, let me get a little uh, background check on you first. Make sure you're uh, crushing live MTTs and such. Because this is Poker Tube's channel after all. Slight delay as Mike gets more stable internet. Feel free to shoot me your questions in the meantime. How many people in the chat as most U.S. residents are still working at this hour? 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Shout out to England, Deadly Croydon.
Feel free to type in chat any questions you might have for Mike Sowers. If you didn't catch my intro and you don't know who he is, go ahead and send a little uh, Google over. You'll see his hand in mob, his great MT success. Very interesting guy, and I think we're going to have a great conversation. Make sure you hit the subscribe button on the PokerTube YouTube channel. We have a lot of great interviews coming up. Next week, we have scheduled USC Phil, though. Phil Collins, November 9er. You're not going to want to miss that one. We might have uh, hung out on my birthday and got out of line a little bit. Could be some stories from that night, along with everything else he's been up to recently. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, I C U R A Rook, Instagram, Jeff Boski, or Facebook. You know where to find me. Check out pokertube.com for all your latest poker news, videos, and uh, you know, all poker related content. If you love poker, you love videos, check out pokertube.com. And okay. we're back. I can hear and see you, Mike Sowers. Yes, welcome. Uh, we're going to be downtown Los Angeles, apparently, since uh, my internet Wi-Fi in my apartment's cutting in and out. So we might get some homeless stragglers running around here, which is uh, always entertaining. Nice. I like the live feel. You never know what's going to happen on the live stream. <laughs> Your mate, guys. Go get this stuff. It's real good. It's yummy. It's good, good version of caffeine. That's South South American tea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can brew it, too. So, like, the bottle I just showed you has sugar. So if you're a real, one of those real nutritionists, you can just buy it, brew it, just like you would green tea and stuff. All it's right. uh, I learned about it through Tim Ferriss. So I listen to a lot of podcasts, always trying to, like, improve. So I listen to, like, Tim Ferriss, Joe Rogan, fun for entertainment value. I listened to the Bulletproof guy for a while, but he kind of got – Kind of refund it. I don't know. Dave Asprey? Yeah, yeah, Dave Asprey. Yeah. Was it some of his uh, stuff debunked with the coconut oil and the fat and the coffee? What was the thing? Yeah, yeah. I do the butter and the coffee a lot. That's usually my first thing. As soon as I wake up, butter, coffee. Sounds uh, too good to be true. How can yeah, I do that? It's for kind it? of crazy, right? Well, yeah. the idea is uh, the more fats you use, the less your body needs to store fat. So. The whole idea is if you cut sugars and carbs out of your diet completely, then your body will turn into just burning fats for fuel. So you don't have to necessarily store your fat anymore. Is that the ketogenic diet? Yeah. Yeah. I've got a, uh, out in LA, you just learn about all the different fad diets. It's kind of funny. I've tried a little bit of all of them. I'm always tweaking and trying something different, I guess. Tweaking? Don't go tweaking on us now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know what at what point you cut out. I was doing your as intro. soon as we started, probably like the minute we went live. I just saw you were like, "Oh shit!" And then it froze, and then I took like you know, I just came straight down, popped on the. Uh, there's a bar right below my apartment that has Wi-Fi. Luckily, so it seems pretty stable. So. All right. Well, I was just telling the viewers uh, that more of more of them are joining us now. A little bit late on the trigger. 
that you hailed from originally North Carolina. You now live in California with over $3 billion in live earnings and $3.5 million in online earnings. Five different six-figure scores. Very impressive. Happy to have you on the Poker 2 podcast. Mike Sowers. Cool. Thank you. Uh, all those accomplishments uh, make me smile. Show that uh, all the work I put in kind of paid off. So. Very impressive. A lot of high rollers or just 1Ks, 10Ks, online, live. You've done it all. Uh, I know after Black Friday, uh, the last uh, accomplishment I spoke about earlier was uh, first place in the Full Tilt Poker 1K multi-entry uh, for 490K two weeks before Black Friday. I seem to remember yeah. railing that. And didn't you also have another entry that got 10? Yeah, I got ninth. So uh, first and ninth because I had two uh, entries entering the final table. Easily probably the best uh, accomplishment of my career just because all the good players had six entries in it. It's $1,000, 2700 I think I had like three finish in the top 150, top 100 or something too. So it was just an exciting night. I think the bigger accomplishment was – uh, I played a high roller all day there. It was in Vienna, Austria is where I was at the time. And I just remember I was playing so good. I was so focused. I played like 12 hours in the high roller. Uh, I lost. It, I drank like half a bottle of wine. I went to all the clubs in Vienna. It was a Sunday night. Everything was closed. So I came back to my room. I remember Skyping with this girl for like 30 minutes just talking. And then I saw the full tilt at the 1K. It was starting at like 2 a.m. Vienna time. And I was like, let's do this. I got all the energy in the world. <laughs> so I'd already been up like 14, 16 hours. I ended up playing that tournament, which lasted another 14, 16 hours. And I remember I just kept going so deep. I was flying out to Amsterdam the next morning. And I just kept changing my flights and canceling flights because I just kept going deep. And I was like, this is sick. And then... I won, so obviously I wasn't sleeping then. So it's easily the longest session of my career. I, I was up 50 hours straight. I didn't get any sleep. I was just wired. I was playing good at the time. I was just in a good frame of mind, and uh, I was just super focused. That's awesome. I, and obviously I, I ran really well that. too. It was kind of cool because I actually did the uh, reviews for the hand histories on um, one of the sites, Tournament Poker Edge. And you could go there and like check out the actual how I played. And I always looked at both the ones at final table and one, I was pretty aggressive and three betting a lot. And the other, I felt I was a little more passive and kind of tight. So I was just adapting to the different tables. And it shows you that, you know, you could have two different styles and just be adapting to basically your surroundings. All right. So you were just in the zone, felt like playing and everything just worked out. Yeah, it was a good year, too. It was like I started out that year. I got uh, sixth or seventh at the PCA, and um, I it was after a long break. Uh, in 2010, basically, I was on a pretty big downswing, probably the biggest downswing in my career, and I had broke up with my girlfriend. I was living in Vegas at the time, and that's pretty much what made me move to L.A. Like uh, It was like October or September. I was just like, I'm getting out of Vegas. I'd lived there for a year. I didn't really like the city. And I was like, let's just go to L.A. My buddy was out here. I had a mutual friend who was uh, coaching football. And I was just like, I just want to go do something other than poker for a while. So basically, I just went out there. I coached football. And uh, I started like JV with my buddy. He was the JV offensive coordinator. And so I just got into it. I just liked being kind of a mentor and just like helping people. And just getting out of the poker world for a little bit was like refreshing. And so when I came back to the PCA, that was pretty much my first tournament back, and I just felt totally great. Like, I was just so fresh. And I, I remember at the time I was reading a lot of different stuff that kind of, like, put me in a zen state of mind. Like, I had read all the Eckhart Tolle books, and I was just kind of, like, overcoming a lot of the stuff in my life that was probably holding me back from, like, accomplishing, like, even greater things. So... I just felt like I did a lot of work in that time where I was coaching football on myself and kind of just took myself out of the poker world and just was like, what do I need to work on as a human being? And then when I came back to the poker world, I just had like a lot more energy and stuff. Nice. How did you get the job coaching football? Did you have previous experience with that? 
Uh, no, I actually, I, I was a quarterback till like middle school. And then I realized like, wasn't really like my forte. So I ended up playing like tennis in high school. I played soccer a little bit. And those were just better sports for my like physical specimen, my athletic talent. And um, so, but I always like, even in, in high school, like all the football players were my friends. And one of my close friends was the quarterback. And I would just always go through the playbook with him and stuff. And he would always be like, Mike, you're going to be a coach one day. And I was always like, I never really took that to heart. And then later I was like, you know what? I want to be a coach. Like, I want to go coach football. I know the game and I want to learn more about the game and just like help kids. And so it more started out for fun and a hobby. And then it grew over six, seven years. Like by the fourth year there at Oak Park High School, we were in the state semifinals. We lost uh, to a team that we had beaten previously. And then... Uh, my buddy actually got a promotion to the offense coordinator at a junior college, uh, Moorpark College here in California. And that was right around the time I was getting my money back from the full tilt thing. It was like 2013, 2014, I guess 2014 we got paid. And uh, so he got that job at Moorpark College and I wasn't really like a credential to go there. I could have went and helped him, but I was just like, I want to go travel and get back into poker and see if I really want to do that or coach. And then after traveling for a year, I was like, you know what, I want to come. He, he was like an assistant on the Moore Park College job for the offense. And then he got promoted to offense coordinator the next year. So he had a lot more clout. And then I met the head coach and I was like, you know what, I want to do this. So I just started recruiting. It was January of uh, 2015, I think. And I just started calling around watching like film on NCSA, like just like a madman. Like whatever I do, I'm just always all in. So... If I'm doing something, it's like pretty much my whole life. So whenever I was coaching football, it was pretty much my whole life. Like I was taking years off of poker and it was, uh, I realized, you know, like it helped me as a human being, but it also put me back a little bit professionally. Like last year was my first year back full time and I was a little rusty. It took me a little time to kind of get back into the game and everyone's three and four betting a lot more often and bluffing rivers by, you know, just jamming all over thin value bets and stuff. So. Yeah, big jokes over the years have to be made. Uh, do you play on uh, daily fantasy football also? Uh, yeah, I've, I've basically grinded the DFS scene for like two years, probably for like tiny profits compared to poker, like, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15%. I have did okay, like I've won a basketball and a baseball tournament, but... Overall, I think that edge is so small, the rake is so high that it's pretty much dead in the water. There's a actually a new crypto out that uh, is called No Limit Coin 2, and you can buy into fantasy sports with Bitcoin, Ethereum, all those things. And uh, the site's kind of janky. It's nowhere close to what DraftKings and FanDuel are, but they're offering a slightly better business model with less rake and stuff. So, I don't know. It's like 20 cent right now. It's worth a look, but... I, I kind of did some DFS as a hobby, and then I started watching crypto a lot, more so after Ethereum ran up, just because a bunch of my friends became, like, pretty much millionaires or multimillionaires overnight. When you're in the poker community, especially if you've had good success and you've traveled a lot, which I have, you make a lot of really smart friends who, you know, are very into business, who also come from money or whatever. And so a lot of people in the book community have really taken to cryptocurrency. I just think the bigger idea behind it is really cool. Like, I think that it offers to the current business model of society. And it just, to me, it looks like a revolution that's happening, which is pretty exciting to watch. I don't know. I think that's way cooler to talk about the DFS. I mean, I'm going to play DFS every Sunday when football comes up for sure. But it's just... Uh, it's it's whatever. Yeah, I dabbled in DFS for maybe six months in Las Vegas. I got real deep into it, just like watching Red Zone, doing all the research. It was so fun. And then all of a sudden, Black Friday for DFS. They just banned yeah. it in Las Vegas. Like, oh, okay, thanks. It got That's, me again. It does make sense, you know? I mean, you're in Vegas. You, you should not be allowed to gamble on DraftKings. That just totally has oh, to Yeah, it doesn't make sense, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, DFS is fun. Obviously, it's blown up, uh, you know, and it just makes watching football so much different. I don't know, like, whenever uh, football season comes around, I'll be watching the NFL 
like you're talking about the game tape. And as after coaching football for six, seven years, I feel like when I look at DFS football, I take kind of a different approach than a lot of people. Like I like to watch the film as a coach and see like how often they're in 21 personnel, 11 personnel, 10 personnel, which basically means how many receivers, running backs, tight ends, they're on the field. So if you watch the Patriots, they always have three wide receivers on the field a lot of times, except for when they were using LeGarrette Blunt, like double tight ends. So that's kind of why I think football DFS is real fun for me because I just I try to stay away from the models as much as I do in other sports, and I just really watch the film and kind of see, like, the guys who are either popping off the film and you can tell, like, the coaches are starting to give them more work or whatever. I think that uh, – I mean, you have a lot of good sites out there that are charting that information too, though, just like how often teams are in 11 personnel, 10 personnel. And I think that if you're playing DFS football, like to me, those are the most important things, uh, more so than like even salary adjustments that the sites make. It's a good tip for all the DFSers out there. Wish I could uh, join you. But I am, uh, I am now obsessed with crypto, like you said. A lot, of, a lot of innovative technology, natural trans transition for poker players that don't get scared when they lose 30% in a day. When they're just used to losing you know, 30% of their role in the day, as it is. We're gamblers by heart. Can you tell our audience a little more about crypto and where do you think it's going to go with all the different altcoins, Bitcoin, Ethereum? Which ones are really going to boom and what applications do they have? Well, this has been like my best week in crypto bar none. It's been it's been a fun ride. Uh, basically, I hopped on Neo at like three dollars fifty cent, five dollars and fifty cent. Uh, I was formerly Ant Shares, and I I got so obsessed once I started learning about all this. Pretty much right before the series began, I actually built an Ethereum uh, mining rig. So I I was reading Reddit. I think that Reddit is the number one place for you to learn all about crypto. Uh, Bitcoin Reddit, Bitcoin Markets, BTC, Ethereum Trader, uh, NEO is the newest one on there. If you just hang out in cryptocurrency Reddit, you're gonna learn so much too. But basically I just became obsessed and I just started listening to all the podcasts and reading. Like one of my buddies put in like 50K in Ethereum when it was like eight bucks and just turned it into a huge wad. And I just was on the lookout for like my my form of Ethereum and uh, it was kind of Neo. I mean, at first I was pretty much all in Ethereum when I first got into it and then I built an Ethereum rig and it's just been, the rig was more like a hobby. It was like I'd made pretty much what I spent on the rig was like $3,000 to build this computer. And I got so lucky. I mean, it's kind of like the story of my life. I've always ran good in the exact right moments. Like. <laughs> Uh, I was reading Reddit and, and these graphics cards are just like sold out across the country, mainly because Ethereum mining was becoming so profitable that all these new graphics cards came out just instantly sold. So I just went around and I like, if you check the websites and stuff, they don't really give you the inventory of these graphics cards because they're, they're so high demand. So I just went around to all the stores, all the fries around here and I walked into this one I walked into two basically and they were just like laughing at me. They were like, nah, dude, they're gone. And then I walked into this other one and they were in a shopping cart about to be put on the shelf. And I was like, I'll take all those. And they were like, how many do you want? I was like, I want six. He's like, why does everyone buy six? We have seven of these. I was like, fuck it. Give me seven. I'll, yeah, whatever. And they even had a, I bought the 580 RX, RX 580s, eight gigs. And, uh, they even had another whole shopping cart, another seven that I should have bought that were like the 584 gigs. Whereas at the time, if I would have just turned around and sold those, I would have made double my profit. Anyways, I just decided to build the rig and I just bought a motherboard. I really am not a very good computer person. Uh, I built a computer way back in the day, like 2011 maybe. I built this like Alienware type computer, just like top of the line when I first made a bunch of money. And uh, I used to play like computer games. So I built the computer way back then for computer games. And uh, so I built this Ethereum mining rig. It's, I've made about half of the money back and it's been about a month and a half, but there's been some different things. Like when I was going deep in the 5K at the WSOP, 
uh, I just kept coming home and seeing my rig, it was still running, so I just assumed it was good. And then when I checked it, it was like the 6th of July, I just, I have it hooked up to a, uh, my TV monitor, so I just switched over and I just saw that it had been hung for like a whole week. So it was just froze for a week, not mining, but still running. And so that was a little frustrating, like growing process, whatever. But I just look at all the all the crypto stuff. Like I always tell my coach, like I have a coach uh, mainly for life and poker, but I've had him for about six, seven years. And I've always told him and everyone that if I had to do it all over again, I would have just been a trader. Like I always love trading stocks and I always felt like your upside in trading is just like hundreds of percents where if you're the best poker player in the world and you're playing tournaments or even cash, your ROI is probably only a hundred percent, you know, depending on the games you're playing and whatever. And I just always felt like, man, if I had to do it all over again, I would have just been a trader. And so when crypto came along, kind of gave me a second chance at that. And I kind of, you know, I have a risky appetite, so I put a pretty good portion more that, so than I would ever recommend to other people. I would say if you're new to crypto or, or you're just learning or you want to invest a little, just like 10% of whatever your net worth is. But um, And I would just start with the big ones like Bitcoin, Ethereum are pretty solid and I think they're just going to go up. I think that, you know, we're just touching uh, a huge market because if you look at the amount of money that's put into crypto, it's like 1% of the entire net worth of, of, you know, the GDP or whatever. So, and not many people still don't know about it. So I think that there's a lot of growth opportunity. There's obviously huge risk involved. I would say like the, the market isn't really built on fundamentals. So if you come from the stock market and you're used to looking at profit margins and stuff like that, you probably aren't going to do as well trading as if you just watch news and stick to your nose and Reddit and look at what new things are going to be popping off for different blockchains. One of the big things that got me involved in NEO, formerly known as Anshares, was it's a Chinese um, blockchain that's offering public and private blockchains that interact together. And they're already like quantum hacking safe and quantum hacking is not even here yet. So you could kind of see that they were very forward thinking and they also are offering smart contracts like Ethereum. And I just think that like the way China works is they like investing in stuff that's Chinese. So if you see like Twitter, for example, it's not as big in China, like they have their own little spinoff of everything. So I really felt like watching and reading everything that this thing was going to do well. And I bought it at like $3.50 and $5.50 and they had this press conference. And that was pretty much the first reason I bought it back in June. And it ran up to like 14 bucks and then it came back down to like six and I just held the whole time. Because I truly believe in all of these things is kind of long-term things. Like you can do really well short-term trading, but I'm not good enough on the technical analysis part of that to try to get in and out of the market. And I would suggest that most people probably aren't. You should just buy and hold long term. Even if it dips, probably shouldn't panic sell, stuff like that. But uh, the NEO thing, it pretty much shot up to like, I don't know, it's 35 bucks or so right now, but it's really fluctuating. And it was basically because they rebranded this whole week and they actually have a working product now. Um, so I think there's still a lot of upside for that. I, I Just watching the markets, I kept looking at quantum and every single time, Ants and Neo went up, Quantum went up, and it's just another Chinese project. And so I eventually bought a little of that just because I saw it chasing Neo every time. And I was like, well, I know Neo is going to go up, so I might as well buy Quantum. But I don't know, I'm in a lot of channels, and I would just suggest to people it's an information game right now. It's just about trying to soak in and learn as much information as possible. And I think that the people that are going to do that the most are going to have the most success. Uh, it's pretty cool because I got friends of friends who have like one guy bought 200,000 Bitcoin when it was a dollar and he's only cashed out like $10 million worth. He just believes that Bitcoin's going to be worth more than USD in the future and that USD's, you know, fiat money is probably not going to be worth much once like the inflation stops or whatever. Like I think the crazy thing about 
cryptocurrency is that it offers decentralization, whereas in all the governments, including the United States, we have a central bank that's basically, most people think it's like a government order, but the Federal Reserve is a private bank that basically loans money to the American government and prints money, just keeps printing. And every time we've seen in history where people just print money, it doesn't end well. Like Iceland had a huge bubble with money. So like the people, I think it's funny when people are like crypto is a bubble because it's like you're living in a bubble because you know, everything is a bubble. Everything is literally about perception of people. And so the crypto market is just like poker in a way because it's all about psychology. And so I think that if you can just gauge the psychology of the masses and, you know, act accordingly and just watch charts and kind of uh, get in and out based on the sentiment, then I think you'll do really well. Uh, the biggest thing that also I like about NEO is like Chinese, China has more billionaires than anywhere in the world. So you talk about investment, you're talking about a lot of the billionaires in China are like, they buy these freaking apartments and just stack them full of cash. So it's just insane to me. I was in Macau and I just heard all these stories about like these billionaires who literally just have like apartments sitting full of like cash. And I think it makes a lot more sense for those types of people to put their money into like coins and stuff or whatever. So yeah, it's probably more secure yeah. if you have a cold wallet, storage wallet. And I agree with like 100% of everything you just said. That's a very informational way to look at cryptocurrencies, the fiat dollar, and what's going on in the world right now. Uh, there's, I think there's a few negative things with crypto. I mean, I'm a big fan myself, but I think there's a few things that the government could do which would really put a damper on crypto as a whole towards the American public, as they've done in such news articles as uh, linking it with the dark web, uh, pedophilia, uh, money laundering, they uh, highlight all the worst aspects of it to keep uh, the American people, uh, you know, all for the U.S. dollar. Yeah, well, that's their job. I mean, they're basically a huge corporation anyway, and if they're not trying to get profits for their corporation, they're doing a disservice to their own company. So, yeah, I think the biggest uh, thing that I would tell people is when you get involved in cryptocurrency and you send Bitcoin to the wrong address, it's gone forever. So. The biggest thing I could ever tell everyone out there who's never done anything with Bitcoin, Ethereum, or all of this is every single time you send money, make sure you send the very minimum possible for the first time to the address, just so that you don't lose money because there are so many horror stories out there and there's gonna be so many more horror stories when mainstream adoption starts to occur just because of you know, the, basically how the, how it's set up, you know, like once you send your money out in a database, often if it's a wrong address or a different type of address, that money is gone and no one's there to protect you like your bank would do if it was sent to the wrong place. So that's isn't another it, big drawback. Isn't it with certain coins, the address changes every time it gets, a, gets one? Uh, well, what happens is like a lot of times if you're on exchanges and stuff, they'll, they update their addresses every seven days or whatever. But if you have like a private wallet, you probably, no matter what, your old address will work usually. Like they don't recycle the addresses unless you technically, I don't even know if you can go in and delete it or not. But uh, a lot of the private wallets, what happens is you can just keep creating new addresses and you'll have a limit, I don't know, five, seven, however many. And people, I guess it's just a, a safety precaution or a security mechanism that's built in. Yeah, because I've seen people say, you know, hold up that one guy at Congress that said, you know, don't donate to my Bitcoin address or buy Bitcoin, and he held up his Bitcoin address. So that obviously wouldn't expire after everyone sends him. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Whatever. So that's yeah, a think, great thing. <laughs> just copy and paste that shit. Don't write it down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, copy and paste. I don't know, I kind of have a horror story just because I play a lot of uh, online poker still and I've played on America's Card Room and Ignition and I really haven't had great experiences and I, I just tend to lean more towards playing cash, but when they run cash in LA, local casinos and stuff, but when they run these big tournaments, it's hard not to want to jump in. And I actually lost like a thousand dollar Bitcoin sent to Ignition where I just always copy paste or I use my phone to take a snapshot of the CR code that they give me. 
and I basically sent them all the transaction logs and everything, and they just told me that that wasn't their wallet. Ignition did. And so I would just, all, I don't know, it's kind of, you know, a gray, it's always been a gray world with online poker, so um, I don't know. And then America's Card Room basically kept stalling cash outs for months at a time, especially early June when Bitcoin and Ethereum were making these huge run-ups. It was obvious that they were just hoarding the Bitcoin, kept putting off uh, withdrawals three to five days, and then you would email them and they would say all oh, the withdrawal got canceled and stuff. So I would just advise people there's some shady, shady actors in the poker community, which is really sad because uh, it's kind of like the act of America trying to legislate poker made it more uh, dangerous, which is kind of funny, which is kind of uh, what all these blockchains are trying to do, especially like if you hear, I would tell everyone to go listen to the guy who made Ethereum. He's like this 19, 20 year old Vitalik guy. This guy is pretty genius and he just talks about trustless smart contracts. And what that basically means is that we don't need the United States government or we don't need a bank for me and you to make a contract. So the, the way that that would work in poker would be phenomenal. Imagine if I'm backing you in poker and now we don't need like a verbal agreement, we have it in a blockchain where you're gonna play that tournament. If you win cash in that tournament, it instantly sends me my percent. It instantly sends to your wallet your percent. And what he means by trustless contracts are that I don't require trust anymore because the system is automated. So everyone in poker for 10 years all these things, all these business deals are built on trust. You know, most of the business deals I've ever done, in fact, I've probably never had a contract. You know, I've never had a contract to anybody who's bought action of me or I've bought action of anyone else. Of uh, This is this and that is that. It's just based on trust. So what these things offer are mechanisms to where trust isn't an issue anymore because the system's automated. And so... This whole summer, once I started getting into all this and reading about it and educating myself, I was like, man, like the cool thing about all this is that it's gonna help even poker, like poker business deals, you know, this Zoe guy who oversold himself or whatever, like, I don't know what you're doing cash in the main event if you're doing that, but also I just, it's like, it offers a solution to a lot of problems in the world. And so that's really why I think it's inevitable that it's going to explode because it's offering solutions. So whenever you're looking at blockchains and you're looking at new ones that are claiming to be Ethereum or Bitcoin or any of this, I would recommend that you always ask the question, what solution is this going to solve? And if it can't solve a solution or it solves a very small solution, like earlier I talked about no limit coin, the crypto fantasy thing. And that's like, I always look at coins like that as very limited upside because all they're doing is solving a solution of DraftKings FanDuel's rake is too high. So we're going to slightly lower the rake. But you need to find blockchains that are going to offer solutions to the world's biggest problems. And if you find those, those will be the ones that will reap you the biggest reward, which is why blockchain and Bitcoin right now is just the highest thing in the world because it offers a solution for me and you to exchange hands of money without an intermediary, which is the first step and the building block of the whole blockchain in, in itself, basically. Yeah, Ethereum can really make a big difference maker when it comes to even uh, real estate agreements or selling and buying cars, any type of contract where you don't need a contract. It's all in the blockchain and you, no one can back out. No one can screw anybody because it's all right there. The confirmations are there. If you do this, I do this, we have a deal. Yeah. The toughest part is going to be how do we incorporate real world interactions onto the blockchain? You know, because like, how do we incorporate putting that tournament that I'm staking you for into the Ethereum contract? You know, I think that's going to be the biggest kind of bridge that we're going to have to build in order to incorporate more stuff. I think uh, another thing too is wills. Like wills are about to change so much. I'm looking at crypto and like 
if I died tomorrow, my mom would have no clue how to get into my crypto. It would just be like my brother would have to like find a way so that my mom could get my money or whatever. And it's, it's kind of the same way as it, it's not as simple as even if I left money on full tilt poker and I died tomorrow, like my mom would kind of know how to get into full tilt poker and withdraw. But with blockchain, uh, I think that, and there's like already new ICOs and new companies coming out that are all about wills, but wills are going to be a whole ball game changer in and of itself because you're going to have a lot of billionaires and a lot of smart money. Even uh, conservative people are putting one to 2% of their money in crypto, which is going to be a lot of money. And when those people die and in, inheritance and stuff like that, it's going to be very interesting to see how that goes and, you know, what are the methods and steps for that. And I would, I would encourage everyone that has Bitcoin or Ethereum to incorporate some type of plan that if you die tomorrow and your family, like a lot of people don't know a lot about this, that you leave some type of, you know, instructions in the sand type of stuff to where, you know, they know how to get to it or they know what to do with it. That's a very good point. I've, I've thought about that a lot, but then I, part of me is like, oh, I'm dead. The simulation's over. Yeah, who cares? Yeah. But at well, the same the simulation time. simulation is about other people, right? Like True. that's the cool thing about life. Like if you go through it and you sit in your room all the time or whatever, which I've done probably a lot more than I should have, you, you're not as happy as when you're spending it with other people and, you know, sharing experiences. I think that one, as a poker player, as a professional poker player, that's been one of the toughest things I've ever gone through is you create this persona where you have to do it all. It's all about you and no one can really help you. So like when you're going through struggles, like, and people are trying to uplift you or whatever, like it's tough to listen to because you're just like, I got to fix this myself. And so that's the cool thing about coaching football that taught me a lot was life's about more than you. And it's really, at the end of the day, it's, I think life's about how many people you affect, whether it's just with your kind heart, your funny jokes, your laughter, or just being around you. I think that, you know, the more you do that, the better at whatever you're doing, you're going to be. And I think that the happier you are is a byproduct or, you know, an end result of, how happy you're making other people or the things that you're doing for other people that kind of give you fulfillment. I never found fulfillment in poker. It was short lived every time I would win money or whatever. And I would just, and I've always, even today, I always question like, what am I doing? Like, why am I here? You know? And I, I'm not a very religious person. I would say I probably practice Buddhism more than anything. I try to like just empty the mind and just like I do that's one of the reasons I picked up yoga and just like I don't meditate as often as I used to but meditation is a very good tool just for like kind of as you say like the simulation just pretty much getting in tune with it and I think that all those things make you a better poker player a better football player a better whatever if you're doing those things makes a lot of sense um Going back to the Bitcoin thing and deaths and uh, the transactions that get lost forever, I wonder how many of the oh, eventual 21 million Bitcoins are going to even be remaining with all the lost hard hardware wallets, the lost original hard drives, the lost transactions. I'd be lucky if half of the 21 million are even in circulation. Won't that raise the price a lot? Yeah, that's going to raise the price a lot, but also eventually there's going to be hacking involved that's going to gain access to those funds like it's just a matter of time before supercomputing and stuff gets here which is kind of why neo is pretty brilliant because they're already ahead of the game in the hacking regard like eventually quantum hacking is going to be here and quantum hacking is going to be able to get to those funds that we're talking about but the cool thing is is like bitcoin ethereum all these things are gonna you know they're gonna adjust as time goes on but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that there's ways to already see exactly how many are lost. I mean, the thing is, is like even early adopters, some of those people might be dead who had a lot and those could be lost. So yeah, that's gonna definitely increase the price. But I think that it doesn't increase the price as much as people think. I mean, it depends on how many are lost. If over half are lost, then yeah, it's increasing the price quite a bit. But. Well, I think the interesting part is you're starting to see a lot of adoption. If you go to Goldman Sachs website, they've got a blockchain little information thing. If you go 
Like if you listen to a PayPal guy talk, and this is the guy who's leading money manager or whatever, money exchanger in the world kind of almost, and he's talking about Bitcoin's gonna be worth 500K in five years or whatever, like, Next. I think you're, yeah, what, you're getting a lot of outrageous <laughs> claims, but that's because it's already been pretty outrageous anyway. So it's just interesting to see, you know, the human imagination. I mean, we, we can imagine very big things. Yeah, I think uh, the 500K in three years, he's trying to place bets on Twitter. People were trying to, you know, escrow 100K bets with him that it wouldn't happen. And he made some pretty crazy claims about if it doesn't happen, what he's going to do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know I mean, what I'm talking about. I, I, yeah, I think that uh, he should have to do that on video. <laughs> That's what he said. He said on, on video. Dark, he would eat it on, on video. Web. Uh, yeah, gross. well, I guess we can't say dick on the uh, Google Hangout. Huh? Oh, no, you can say whatever. It's just a uh, pretty disturbing yeah. image yeah, they, in someone's mind. Yeah, pretty disturbing. I mean, I don't know. But, but yeah, he's confident. I, yeah, and I would say to like, I'd like to just say to like all those poker players out there and stuff, like the reason I like started coaching in the first place was because I was pretty depressed. And if you looked at me from the outside, you would say like my mom used to always tell me like, Michael, you've accomplished so many things. Like you've been five continents, you've traveled the world and blah, blah, blah. And it kind of led me to this ayahuasca thing that I did at Amazon. like. I was going to these Tony Robbins seminars and I met this guy whose brother was a shaman in Peru. And so I just started reading about all these psychedelic things. And it's pretty amazing how these psychedelics are kind of like another example of the US government prohibiting something that could be possibly very helpful for many people. Uh, this ayahuasca is basically comes out of the bark of a tree and you brew it and it's a psychoactive ingredient kind of like shrooms that grow on cow dung. And it's funny because all these things are natural, but since we live in a society that has basically told us from the day we were born that these things are evil and, you know, they're no good for you here. And so you have to break down all these, I had to break down all those misconceptions I had by reading books like, I read so many books and then I actually flew my cousin out to Amsterdam the first time I did shrooms. And it was just an amazing experience. Like every time I do these things, I just like meditate. And the biggest like lessons I've always gotten were replace fear with love. And I always feel like, like I feel like that applies to poker as much as anything in the world. Because if you play poker a long time, you know that if you're playing while you're scared, you're just not going to play very well. That fear, whatever it does, it changes the way your brain thinks. And whenever you just love what you're doing, you're going to make the right decision a lot more than if you're scared. And for me, I went on this two-week trip through the Amazon that kind of changed my life in 2012. And I'll never forget, it was amazing. I did ayahuasca and like a couple of the people were like vomiting and some people had diarrhea. Like it, it kind of can, it can do that to you. And I just kept visioning like my brain was like an engine and it was like a hammer, like fixing my brain. And I just like would go on these long rants in my head, almost like John F. Kennedy. Like I was the president just like delivering these speeches that were just like filled with inspiration, but basically to myself. And then like, it was so cool. I got up to, I had a journal in my backpack, so I, it was like midnight. We're in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. We've been there for like a week and a half. We're like hiking through it, in and out. We're being led by these Achuar Indians and the English. And so I basically am like, I get, I tell like one of the people I want to go out to the, they're, we're on these uh, like, what do you call that? Like a porch, you know, like on the back porch where you have these wooden things. Well, we have like these wooden things that are built like five feet off the ground where we're sleeping on and where we're pretty much all laying when we do this ayahuasca. And we have a cutout in the trees. It's all see the stars and stuff. It was so surreal. And I just remember I went and got my journal and I'd go to a back porch. Like I go down, I walk on the dirt and then I get there. 
towards the beginning of the trip or whatever, and I start like feeling my legs burning, and I'm like, "What's going on?" And the two Indians that took me out there, I was like, "Get Danielle, is this what's going on?" And then they're like flashing the light at me, and all of a sudden, for whatever reason, I just take off my pants, and I see these ants crawling up me, like fire ants, and oh. just so like subconsciously whatever i just put my hands like on my privates like covering them first and then work my way down and start getting all these ants off and so i'm like tripping my first time on ayahuasca and then all these ants are like biting the shit out of my legs and i'm like they're flashing lights on me and then i just have this moment where it's like i wanted to just go back and be with the rest of the people and then it was like this moment of like personal growth though is like no, you need to sit out here and overcome like this little obstacle and you need to figure out like what's going on. And so then I just laid there and I meditated like for the next like five, 10 minutes, I was pretty paranoid, obviously, like, are there any more ants and shit? <laughs> but then I put my pants back on. I just freaking like meditated literally for 12 to 14 hours on this psychoactive drug. And then I just wrote it all in my journal. Like I used to keep journals everywhere I go. I have just journals filled with information that is really cool. I'd like to get those on the blockchain just to like save them eventually. But yeah, it was amazing. And just like, it was cool because the next day you sit around and you all talk about your experience with the shaman and this one guy, like literally the two people that were vomiting and stuff the most, they had the most like breakthroughs and they were the ones who enjoyed the drug more than everyone. And was like, this has been so helpful. Like one guy was raped as a kid and he just like vomited. I felt like he was just vomiting all that disgust and all that shit that he had dealt with his whole life. I thought it was coming out like, and that's how he felt. And that's what he shared with the whole group. And so like a lot of people do ayahuasca to like help fight addictions and stuff. And I know with me, it just, it changed my viewpoint so much that I was on a plane. As soon as I got out of the Amazon, I flew from Quito to Spain to go play this poker tournament. It was EPT in Madrid. And I remember being on that plane and I was just like, by the time I landed at the casino, I felt so guilty about being like a person and kind of what we were doing in the world because you learn about like all the things that we're doing to the people in the Amazon and taking away their lives and destroying the rainforest for oil basically. And what happens is when you destroy rainforest, it doesn't come back and it turns into a desert. So eventually like scientists and all this have plotted out that if we keep doing this to the rainforest, not only are we gonna destroy like the people that live there and the rainforest itself, but if you really look at the things that are in the rainforest, there's so many drugs that we've never even learned about, all these different plants that have all these powerful healing things and abilities. Like, I think that's like kind of the hippie in me where I'm just like, I think that if something's growing on earth, it's gotta be there for a reason. Like if people wanna be religious and say that God is this and that, well, the earth must be like the ultimate religion because we're here and there's stuff on here that can help us that we don't even know about. And that, you know, I, there's this amazing new blockchain that's actually going to start uh, collecting money to start doing different uh, research into the psychoactive drugs, even like MDMA and stuff, which I find completely fascinating and amazing. But uh, yeah, when I landed in Spain, by the time I played this tournament, I was in tears, like totally shook up. Like the whole worldview was destroyed. It was like, I felt like this guilty person who had just been trying to get money and just strive to do all those type things my whole life. And I kind of took a step back and I played that tournament. I played like shit just because I was so emotionally disturbed, but it, it just offered me a different worldview. And I think that's my biggest gratefulness with poker is that it just, it changed my life in so many ways. And I just used it to always educate myself and always keep learning. And I think that's the cool thing about when you travel, you learn a lot about other people, other civilizations. And then I went to this place that I would have never went to coming from small town, North Carolina. Like I grew up in Thomasville, like population 20,000. I always knew I was an alien and I had to get out though. Like I was just way different and I just wanted to see the world and kind of just be free. Wow, that's, that's wow. a great story. Uh, part of that reminded me of uh, Medicine Man with Sean Connery. Have you ever seen that movie? No, I haven't. Uh, I, mean, I don't 90s. remember movies. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, he, he's like in the Amazon with his tribe, and they found he's a medicine, he's a doctor or something, and he finds out that this plant mixed with this plant can cure AIDS or cancer or something, but then here comes the bulldozers. And he's like, what the hell? Come on. 
that's exactly what the trip was like. Like at the end of the trip, like you kind of watch a documentary about like all the people you met and then the oil companies and stuff. Like, cause we barely went and saw the oil fields, but it was, it was such an amazing trip. Like we literally took canoes down the Amazon river and I'm just like praying to see an anaconda. I don't know. It was kind of a sick feeling, but I was just like, I'd love to see one of these big, huge hundred foot snakes. Like that would be incredible. Well, isn't these, that kind of what that movie Avatar is all about? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much. I love that movie too. That's a great movie. They're supposed to make another one that's about underwater, but I don't know if they're going to do it or not. I think they are. It's just taking a long time with the special effects, and I think they got rid of James Cameron, but they still have a great team. Uh, it's supposed to come out in 2018, I think. But the underlying message in that movie is is very strong. How. Uh, the U.S. government or whatever just wants to take all the oil from the earth, just like they want to take that uh, the unobtainium secret element from that society, just destroy it for their own personal uh, financial gain for the investors. Yeah, I mean, it's easy. Like as you grow older, you grow cynical in a way because you're like, well, I have my own faults and I'm not perfect and. I'm always going to be somewhat corrupt of an individual myself. So how can I expect this conglomerate or civilization to be any different? I think no matter what, we're always going to be a little corrupt as a civilization or whatever. And I think that's just an example of it. It was fun because going on this trip, there's this woman, Lynn Twist, and she wrote this book called The Spirit of Money. And I would recommend it to everyone. It's a very short read. and It's very powerful. And she was on the trip. And then this other guy, Danielle, and Danielle grew up in South America, and he's just chain smoking cigarettes the whole time. The cynical guy who's like, nothing's going to change, blah, blah, blah. And then Lynn was like this dreamer, like, we're going to save the world and everything's going to be okay. It was just, it was a really cool dynamic to have both of them and kind of get both sides of it. I like one point would be smoking a cigarette with Danielle, like talking to him about it, and the next like kind of all eyes on Lynn listening to her and stuff and so yeah I mean it would be great to save the rainforest and just save people in general and create a green environment but I mean a lot of the stuff that we have nowadays is uh, destroying the earth I mean there's no way to there's no way around that anyone who claims differently is just wrong that's yeah, true uh, yeah, I've seen the, like all the Joe Rogan podcasts. I know he talks about ayahuasca a lot. He also talks a lot about his experience with, with DMT. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, yeah. I tried DMT uh, with a friend of mine in Costa Rica, and a bunch of my friends did it as well. I didn't like DMT as much because it was so instant. It was in and out, like two and a half minutes, and uh, it was cool. My experience with that was like, your body just feels super warm and then you you kind of travel i felt like i was traveling through this vortex of yellow geometric figures that were like talking to me about like everything's going to be okay and you are loved and you are safe and all this stuff it's kind of funny because obviously all these things really depend on your state of mind so it's tough for me to tell you to go do psychedelics. Some people probably should never do them, and some people need to do them more than anything in the world. I'd say educate yourself, and you know, if you do do them, do them with someone who's very experienced who can offer a lot of safety around the whole experience. And I would also say to do them in nature. Like, pretty much the only time I've ever did these things, I've been in nature, like camping out or whatever. And um, yeah, the DMT was just too quick for me. It was uh, it was a cool experience, but I never did it again just because I didn't find a lot of value for for what I was trying to accomplish. And uh, yeah, makes sense. Have you ever seen that Netflix uh, documentary, DMT: The Spirit Molecule? Yeah, I watched it. It's not as good as the book. The book, the book, DMT: The Spirit Molecule by Rick Strauss will blow everyone's mind. It will just if every doctor in America or just every person, I feel like, look, because it does offer a lot of the different experiences from people who are getting injected in a hospital setting, which is probably not a very good setting to do this stuff in anyway, but it, it gave a lot of insight to it. And this was a doctor who was doing it. So it was ran like a very clinical study, like pretty much the closest thing to a clinical research project we've ever had surrounding almost any drug. Uh, you're very knowledgeable and uh, 
the mind and the whole environment that we're in. I'd love to have uh, possibly another podcast in the future. We'll talk to the people with YouTube, see if you can do this again. I'm sure it'll get great reviews. Um, there's one hand I saw in an interview where in 2013, I believe, you got pocket queen or pocket nines versus pocket queens on a 987 board. Can you talk more about that? And I still don't understand what happened. Man, all right. So if any of my friends are watching, they're going to laugh because I'm the absolute worst at remembering hand histories. And when I talk to my friends about hand histories, they literally laugh at me like I'm a retard. So <laughs> I'll try to explain it. Basically, what happened was uh, I got it all in with a set of hands, and the other guy had queens on like a three heart board. Let's say the flop is six, seven, nine, or whatever it was, three hearts. And we're both all in, and he shows his cards, I show my cards, and the dealer is literally sweating as if he's on drugs, and he's looking at me in my eyes, and he says, sorry, bud. Before he deals the turn or the river, he says this to me. And so instantly, I'm like, what? Like, I'm a, I don't know, do you, are you, you don't know what the winning hand right now. And then the turn is a heart instantly, and it gives the queens a queen of hearts, and I'm out. I'm out of the tournament. I just like look at the dealer for a little bit and then I just leave and luckily Ryan Rice was at my table or whatever but as I'm leaving and I'm walking out the front door I'm like texting a few of my friends like craziest thing ever happened to me at the World Series just happened to me and then I'm like wait I better tell everyone about this because this is fucked up like something's wrong here like I just knew as soon as I hit the exit door at the Rio that something was wrong and so I tweeted about it and then Ryan Rice tweeted that like the dealer started laughing when I left like I think he must have forgot to cut the deck or whatever I went back and tried to figure out exactly what happened by like dealing out hands because like it just made no sense to me it was all in a row like six eight nine all the hearts or whatever but uh they never told me what happened but when I went back, uh, I tweeted, and then Jack Eppel, he starts tweeting at me to come, no, he direct messages me to come back to the Rio, and I had just went through traffic. I was staying at Platinum across the way, and I just went through traffic. It was like 5.45 p.m., and I'm upset. Like, I, I'm a real sore loser, so when I lose, I'm just like, just leave me alone. I just need to recharge for the next day or whatever, and so uh, I'm, like, tweeting. I, like, message him back, like, why am I going to come over there? Like, what's the, what do you want me? Are you going to show me what's on film or something? And he's like, just come back over here. And I come back over there and I talk to him. They make me wait for like 15, 20 minutes. And I was like, what happened, man? Like, what's going on? And he's like, well, we're going to offer you a refund. But, and I was like, all right, but like, what happened? He never told me what happened. He just told me, you know, don't tell anyone, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you know, I don't know what happened, but I know that I don't know what happened. And I know they do know what happened. And I was the only person that I've ever known or talked to to ever get a refund from the World Series of Poker, which uh, you can add to the list of accomplishments, I guess. But pretty, pretty, pretty uh, crazy story. That would have, if it would have happened to an amateur, would have just been like out a tournament. And I had an above average starting stack, and it was very early in the tournament. But still, I mean. I can't really blame them that much. I don't know if they did anything shady or not. I only have my doubts and my suspicions. Overall, the World Series poker, I think, is very, you know, real uh, system, and they've done a great job. And I just am so grateful for, like, having the opportunity every summer to go play there. Like, it's literally my favorite time of the year, and I just love anything where I can just dive in for a month and a half and just be obsessed with and not have to worry or think about anything else, which is – what it offers and uh yeah that's that's a crazy wsop story for you yeah it's wild for the dealer to turn to you and say sorry bud like he knows you're about to get beat in like the most he definitely sinister knew. way he definitely knew i mean ryan rice kind of thought that uh i think he said that maybe the guy forgot to cut the deck and maybe the guy realized it mid-hand or whatever so if you're a poker dealer out there and you make a mistake mid-hand, just be a man and call the floor and be like, hey, I made a mistake. We got to fix this or whatever the thing should be. Rather, I know the guy got fired, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of 
goes to show that like if you try to cover up a mistake and lie about it or whatever i don't i don't even know what's going through the guy's hand it's like the zoe situation like you're the dealer like you look at a guy and you tell him sorry bud before the next card's out like are you trying to lose your job are you trying to be dumb like are you trying to cash the main event for more than you owe like i don't know what's going on some people i mean we all as people have these blunders of mistakes that are often just comical like how could that happen type of stuff so whatever well yeah according to the report it was a 987 all heart board six of hearts on the turn so four of the same art suit uh numerical suit and then an offsuit queen on the river so no yeah, matter guess, what you're gonna lose the hand yeah i guess the guy knew that he had forgot to cut the deck and so he knew what cards were coming off is like the most realistic because whenever i was walking out i was like wait i might have just this guy might have just been like he just might have had it out for me or something just like trying to set me up and get me out you know like set the deck up kind of so to speak because i was like that's wild wow, glitch in the matrix they're out to get you <laughs> yeah cool yeah I, I appreciated you having me on i've enjoyed the talk it's uh it's pretty cool because I couldn't have done this five years ago. It took me a long time to kind of grow up as a man and be willing to talk about my experiences, especially with like psychedelics, stuff like that. I mean, I come from a pretty small town, religious type town where it's pretty frowned upon. And uh, I, don't know, I guess I grew up enough to stop giving a shit what most people think. And as long as I uh, think that I'm doing the right thing, I'm going to keep trying to do that. No, I thought it was great. I've had uh, Lucky Chewy on the podcast before. Uh, pretty yeah. similar type conversation more towards uh, vegetarianism, some veganism, stuff like that. But we touched on some psychedelics, yoga, meditation, uh, the greater meaning of life. And I thought those are some of my favorite podcasts because we're all trying to figure it out. And if you got more answers than the average guy, you've seen things and experienced things that others haven't. I think it's always great if you could think outside the box in any given situation and just, you know, keep an open mind as to what's really going on. And, you know, just because hallucinogenics are illegal doesn't mean that, that they're bad for you necessarily. Like you said, if you're in the right situation, the right state of mind, they can help out your life immensely. Yeah. And I feel like if you've had all the experiences I've had, like you almost have a responsibility to share them with the world. And so that's kind of where I'm at now. Like, that's the reason I always kept journals because eventually I always felt like I wanted to write a book eventually one day. Like the problem is, is I want to be so vulnerable and just share the most deep experiences that it's tough to actually do that. But maybe no, I'll grow think, again in the next 10 years. I think it's great. I think this podcast will help a lot of people. I'm uh, excited to see all the feedback it will get. And I think it's a, uh, it's true. Like the alcohol versus marijuana debate. You hang out with 100 people that are drunk on alcohol and 100 people that are high on marijuana, you'll notice that those uh, marijuana people are going to be a lot nicer, a lot more giving, a lot more caring than 100 people that are just drunk and poisoned by alcohol. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a lot of viewpoints. I just always agree that even if something's bad for you, if you want the choice to do it, you should be allowed to do it, period, you know? Yeah. I feel that strongly about everything, you know, like even like, I mean, obviously you should not be allowed to rape children or do anything sinister like that. But as far as drugs are concerned, I mean, even the way like Netherlands handles drugs is, is a real good learning lesson because like we treat in America, we treat like heroin addiction and stuff like this as crimes. Whereas in Amsterdam, it's treated as a health problem. And I think that the first step in America we should make is also adopting, treating it as a health problem. I live downtown Los Angeles and it's opened my eyes so much because there are so many people. I, I live literally two blocks from Skid Row and there are so many homeless people out here, whether it's drugs, but I see a lot of it's just mental illness. A lot of it is just these people have no clue. And even if we gave them or we put them in mental institutions, I don't think that they would go necessarily voluntarily. So I don't know the solution. It's a, it's a crazy, crazy thing to watch. It's opened my eyes up a lot. Like it's definitely made me care a lot more about it. Like I still don't really give to the homeless like 
as much as I should at all, just because, I mean, they're always asking. It's kind of like feeding the pigeons. If you start doing that, then whatever. But my mom came out here for a week and a half, and she was just handing out dollar bills everywhere, just like da-da-da-da-da. And I was like, whatever. But it's definitely a problem that we should address somehow because it's all just a mental illness. And I think that the reason people, so many people are afraid of drugs is because of addiction. And I witnessed addiction growing up like, uh, my stepfather was basically a drug addict, so I I got to see a good glimpse of it, and it, I think it offered me a good lesson early on in my life. And I I don't know I think that especially the mental illness problem is something that seems to be growing almost exponentially, just because the way society is uh, kind of evolving, we actually see less of each other and we connect less. And I think that that feeling of disconnect is what fuels addiction and fuels mental health issues uh, whenever we don't feel connected with each other. And I don't know. That's a great point. Uh, you know, there's a lot of problems out there. We just kind of find the right solutions and uh, make the world a better place. Yep. Do the best you can. Yeah. Appreciate absolutely. having me on. Thanks again, Mike. I really appreciate you joining us for the poker tube podcast of the day. Mike Sowers, ladies and gentlemen. He's occasionally, occasionally on Twitter, Mike Sowers, Inc. And, uh, you know, find him on Facebook, social media, uh, deep in the crypto world, making those profits, making the world a better place, helping out others. Thanks again, Mike. Uh, if you want to hang on, we'll talk a little bit off stream or I'll talk to you All on right. Facebook. And uh, thanks again for joining. Thanks.